A brief recap. In the last episode, I introduced an unusual period in the history of Roman Republican coinage in the late 2nd, early 1st century BC. And at the end, I briefly touched on the coinage of Lucius Julius Bursio. Bursio is one of the Roman moneyers to have produced a large issue in this period, and one of the moneyers who has been subsequently subjected to a die study by De Reuter in 1997. Like the more famous issue of the money of Crapusius, Bursio's coins feature sequencing marks. Unlike the issues of Crapusius, these do not uniquely identify all of the dies. The obverse marks consist of symbols, which are shared by multiple dies. For the reverses, there are four groups. Reverses with a Roman numeral, reverses with a pair of letters, usually a consonant and a vowel, reverses with a vowel and dots, and reverses with no mark at all. In some cases, there are die links that connect these different groups together. I'm going to draw some conclusions about the relationship between these groups later, but it's worth noting for now that they are not sequential, which is the working assumption you would likely start with. The die links show that. It's also worth noting that this is one of those cases in which the interpretation rests on just a handful of links, and to revisit the topic that I explored last year, when your conclusion rests on just one or two links, that is the moment when an error is most likely to have a deleterious effect on your analysis. I'll show you a problem like that in a moment. However, that is not the topic for today. Today, I am going to talk about the practical issues of making sense of a complex die group, particularly part of the largest group in the 1997 study, which De Reuter labelled Linkage 103. This is the chart published by De Reuter. It is a contender for one of the largest die groups ever published, and since the dies also have these sequencing marks, which indicate the order in which they were made, it is a group whose analysis is important from a theoretical point of view, as well as for those interested in Republican coinage. Today is only going to scratch the surface. I'm going to talk a little bit about my process when I look at this type of data, I'm going to look at an oddity which turned up with the numbered group and draw some preliminary conclusions about the relationships. The very first thing you have to do, because there is no standard textbook, is get your head around the idiosyncrasies of the particular study you are looking at. With De Reuter, and actually this is a general problem with Roman Republican works, that is in the plates. There are two ways to organise the plates for a die study. The first way is that you can present images of all the obverses and images of all the reverses. In this case, that would be about 900 images on 20 to 30 plates. The advantage of this method is that it is very easy to check a new coin to work out which dies we use to make it. The alternative is to illustrate every die combination. This makes it hard to look things up, but it is much easier for readers to check that your catalogue is correct. In this case, it would probably take 1100 to 1200 images and 30 to 40 plates. As that suggests, the plates will always be a major chunk of any die study. But De Reuter published just 70 images on two plates, which means, of course, you cannot actually check any of his die identities. What you have to do is look up the reverse control mark in the catalogue, then cross check that against a table of symbols for the obverse which works fine unless the reverse doesn't have a mark, true for over a hundred dies, or the obverse symbol is off flan, or you have one of the symbols or marks which is ambiguous. How can a mark be ambiguous? Well, these are sequencing marks for the production of dies, but they weren't intended to identify the dies. So you have both a die marked 15 in Roman numerals, and a die marked with the same characters but this time intended as the letters XV. How do we tell whether the engraver intended a number or a pair of letters? The answer is that we do it through die groups. This die is die linked to another ambiguous reverse, but that reverse is linked to the number 8, which is unambiguously a number. And the same is true for the XV die, that is linked to other dies with letters. 
This becomes really obvious when you're doing a dye study, but without a dye study it would actually be almost impossible to work out which one was intended. And that is important. In 2012, Wichonsky wrote a paper about the dye marks on Republican coins in which he argued that the marks were present to trace plated forgeries back to independent contractors at the mint. It's obviously wrong, because the marks don't work that way. But it's worth emphasising this kind of idea floats around a lot because people focus exclusively on the coinage of Cropusius, which I covered in the last episode, and assume that is the normal way that things work, rather than, as it actually is, a rather exceptional production. Which brings me to another important consideration. The system appears to change with the moneyers, which suggests that it is being directed by the money, who are political appointees, not by the mint administration, who are technical experts. We should not expect these marks to serve a single purpose, or even to be a particularly competent response to whatever issue they were supposed to address. They are much more likely to be incompetent and idiosyncratic. Anyway, I am supposed to be talking about my process. Once I had got my head round using the catalogue, the first thing I did was pull down a lot of data from the internet. Coin Archive, the British Museum, the American Numismatic Society's Mantis database, and ignoring the blank reverses, which I can't do very much with unless I do a fresh die corpus, I compiled them into a folder. That was a little shy of 800 images, but given some are the same coin from different sources, and some are presumably duplicates of examples in De Reuter's study, it is probably not a huge number of new coins. I found maybe 20 new die combinations. I wasn't really trying to add to the study, just check some information and generate a set of reference images for myself to compensate for the lack of plates, but I did try and hunt down one specific element of Linkage 103. In the chart, a single die pair with the reverse MA above connects the lettered dies to the numbered dies. According to the catalogue, the sole exemplar of that die combination is located in the Badisha Landers Museum. Given the importance of that link, I consulted the database of that museum, with no success. But fortunately, the staff at the museum were extremely helpful, and having been unable to locate the coin, they emailed me images of the four Bersio coins in the museum. None of them an MA die, and neither the numbered nor lettered die are recorded in De Reuter's catalogue. There must be a recording issue here, but in any case the link remains unattested and really shouldn't have too much weight placed upon it. In practice that won't matter too much, as I am largely going to treat the numbered and lettered parts of the die chart separately for reasons that will be apparent by the end of the episode, though I didn't actually do that initially. My next step was to prepare my own version of the die group so that I could work with it. I'm going to show you this in two different ways. First of all, using Microsoft PowerPoint. I created the basic chart in PowerPoint using the diagram in De Reuter. Then I worked through the catalogue, one entry at a time, checking each link. This task is painstaking but important. One of the biggest causes of errors in die studies is transcription. I found several in De Reuter's study during this process, and we've already seen that one of the links between the numbered and lettered dies is at minimum a transcription error. And transcription errors are basically why analysing die charts into die analysis was essentially impossible until the last few decades. If you try redrawing the chart with paper and pencil, you end up introducing so many errors with each step that the final result is worthless. The computer eliminates that. So here you can see me messing around with the die group in PowerPoint. This was my first session thinking about the data and I'm first of all making a general reorganisation, putting the numbered dies off to one side so I can bring the letters below to the bottom. Sometimes we do not know what order dies were used in, but in this case there is good reason to believe the letters below are later in the sequence than letters above. Then I moved the numbered dies to the top of the page and began a reorganisation of those. As you can see, what PowerPoint is doing is retaining and redrawing the links as I move the dies around, so there is no longer a risk of a transcription error. PowerPoint handles that. Of course, PowerPoint is not a perfect tool. It wasn't really designed for this, so mistakes are possible, and it definitely begins to creak under the weight of a die group this size. An alternative is to use a graph theory software. 
When I first started doing die studies, there was no choice about this. PowerPoint didn't have the functionality and I had to use graph theory software. Now I mostly use PowerPoint. If you are interested in graph theory software, I've heard good reports about Cytoscape and I've had a brief mess with that. You can see me here transcribing the die combinations into a spreadsheet and then marking them as confirmed in cases where I've found an image of a coin with that combination. And finally, what the various singletons, isolated dies and die groups look like when imported into Cytoscape from the spreadsheet. I won't be using that much here, but ultimately graph theory software is very useful for die studies and it's something you should be aware of. The main trade-off is between using a well-established, well-supported tool that everybody else knows and has access to in PowerPoint or using a more specialised tool that has a steeper learning curve, which potentially has more utility if you go through that learning curve. Once I've got the chart into whichever programme I'm using, I do a lot of messing with the charts. This is kind of directed in that I've worked with a lot of die study data, so I have a feel for things, but it's also somewhat freeform. And I usually work with two different layouts for die charts. Die charts usually begin as spider diagrams. The obverses and reverses are organised at random or according to some arbitrary feature such as the type which isn't directly relevant to production. And the links between them are just a confused mess. A spider diagram is an admission you do not understand the die study and it should never appear in print. If a spider diagram does appear in print, it's a sure sign you could improve on the work in that article. This is a useful thing to note. The only other Republican die study with a substantial die group, linkage B in Hirsch's study of Calpurnius Piso Frugi, is exactly this kind of incomprehensible spider diagram and constitutes another published study which could yield far more information than its original author got out of it. A useful working model is the checkerboard diagram. Checkerboard diagrams alternate obverses and reverses and they are very useful when you're working with a die chart initially because while the checkerboard diagram doesn't communicate very much information, it is relatively easy to draw and relatively easy to subsequently manipulate. The linkages in De Reuter's article are all depicted as checkerboard diagrams. The final type of diagram is that based around workstations where vertical columns represent the succession of dies at the mint on different putative workstations or in compartments of the die box. A quick note on workstations, compartments and the die box. These things are all abstractions to help us make sense of the data. It's important to remember they don't necessarily correspond to an actual physical working space or an actual physical box in the ancient mint. No doubt ancient mints did have boxes and presumably sometimes they stored dies in them, but those are not, for our purposes, die boxes. To illustrate the general way these diagrams are used, this is linkage 63 from De Reuter's article, which is the largest die group featuring reverse dies with dots and letters, as it was drawn by De Reuter, a checkerboard diagram. It is a little bit larger than the diagram which appears in the publication, because I have examples of two additional die combinations. One of the first things I did was rearrange it into a workstation diagram. The exact order doesn't matter at this point. I'll often do this multiple times with the diagram, um, trying out different arrangements in order to get a sense, if it's not immediately obvious, how complex the diagram is. And this diagram is pretty simple, which is odd. Let me compare this with one of my attempts at making sense of the letter dies in linkage 103. You can see that in this attempt I marked the page with coloured columns to indicate particular workstations and compartments in order to help me organise it. And this is a much, much more complex diagram. It's not just that it's larger, it's the number of workstations required to explain it, the interconnectedness of the diagram. And it was this that made me look at the various groups in relation to linkage 103 and led me to notice some substantial discrepancies between them. Discrepancies we would not expect if they were successively made by the same people using the same procedures. The lettered section of linkage 103 is non-planner. It likely involved some half a dozen workstations, but its analysis 
I'm going to leave for another day. Every other linkage de Ruyter published is planar. It can, in principle, be explained with just two workstations. Even the numbered dies in linkage 103, which is the largest, most complex set of numbered dies, can be explained simply as two workstations with just two reverse dies at a time. What is scrolling over the screen now is an initial sequencing I prepared. The orange coloured die is the link with the lettered examples, which I've excluded from consideration for the moment. And as you can see, even an initial arrangement like this one I prepared puts the numbers in pretty close to the right order. However, and this is an important point to remember, we do not have all of the dies. Do not have all of the die combinations. This diagram represents only some of the surviving numbered dies, those which occur in linkage 103. And the basic rule of thumb is that the true picture cannot be less complex than our surviving sample, but it can always be more complex. So, is it simply that the lettered dies in linkage 103 appear to be more complex because the sample of them is more complete? This is often the case. When I first published a non-planner chart, i.e. one that has at least three workstations, for the second century coins of the Kushan king Vima Kadphises, it is worth noting that that chart was planner the previous time the dies had been collated in 1984. In 1984, when Goebel looked at the coins, he had 30 to 50 less coins than I did. It was quite a good sample, but not as good as I would later have, and the known links would have been explicable by two workstations. Conceptually, this is one of the hardest elements of inter-die analysis to deal with, trying to evaluate how much difference the missing data makes. To begin to have confidence you are seeing the whole picture, you really need multiple examples of every die, because a die that survives from only one coin can only be recorded in one die combination. Virtually no samples of dies are that good. And the sample for a Republican coinage is no exception. The additional examples I have do not move it a great deal, and even a comprehensive new corpus would not put us to that point. To illustrate, here are the lettered and numbered dies arranged in sequence as tables. Every die that should exist has a cell, and this is why working with the Republican series, even if you're not directly interested in it, but interested in die studies more generally, is so interesting. You can do things like this that you just can't do with other die studies, because some of the marks are sequencing marks. Where a die is unknown to me, I've marked the cell in orange. In a few cases there is a duplicated die. I've marked those in blue. You can see that it is much more common to get a duplicate in the second half of the lettered sequence than the first. As an aside, it is also very common in the dotted sequence. But the other feature of these tables is that there seem to be more missing items in the numbered sequence than the lettered one. And that is not for the obvious reason. I counted the examples and dies in De Reuter's study for the different groups independently. Then I calculated how many dies there should have been. Starting with the dotted dies, the sample is pretty awful, the N over D is less than 4, and there is no question that the lack of complexity in the charts is a function of that. The estimates reckon on an original total of about 50 dies, compared with 54 if we assume three sets of each testified letter. It falls quite a bit short if we assume there originally was a K, V and R in each sequence. The things match better for the lettered groups. The formula predicts 98 dies with the letters above, where we would expect 95, and 78 below, where we would expect 75, um, because that latter series appears to stop at S. You'll notice the N over D is nearly 6, so a more complex chart than the dotted examples is explicable as a better surviving sample. If you're wondering why the N over D, the index number as it is sometimes called, would be significantly higher for one group of coins than another, when they were apparently issued at the same time by the same authority and presumably subject to the same vicissitudes of loss and survival? That is an excellent question and we will get to it in a moment. First, 
the numbered dice. The N over D, and remember this is a rough hand count so it is not precise, is nearly 7. Significantly higher than it was for the lettered dies. So the numbered sample ought to have fewer missing dies and show more complexity in its die charts. And this was a real surprise. The estimate is that there were only originally 120 or so dies. But we have dies numbered up to 146. There are 25 missing numbered dies. Either there is something badly wrong with the sample of numbered dies that is throwing off the estimate. A lot. Or the die engravers did not carve all of the numbers, which seems unlikely. Or, and I think this has to be our working hypothesis, the die engravers made 146 dies, but for some reason 25 of them, and looking at the table it is 25 scattered through the whole production, were never put into use. Just to be clear, De Reuter had the tools to spot this, but no reason to look for it. Remember, I began this process trying to make sense of linkage 103, and it was only when I began to notice discrepancies in the complexity of the numbers, letters and dots in the charts that it occurred to me to go back and look at estimates of the number of dies independently of each other. It has been an article of faith for some time that numbered dies in the Roman Republican series represent complete sequences. All of Carter's work on the Corpusius data assumes that was true. There is a logic to that. It's very hard to leave gaps in a sequence without making mistakes. So it seems almost certain the engravers did number their dies 1 to 146. But in this specific case, it seems that the actual production operated with huge redundancy. So much so that some dies that were available were never actually employed. And this gets me to the first conclusion I drew about Bercio's coinage. We have four distinct groups. The coins with no marks, the letters, the numbers and the dots. As noted earlier, the connections between them suggest they were not produced sequentially. But there are major differences. Apart from the obvious but non-trivial point that one group does not mark its dies, there are markedly more dies in some groups than others. The N over D values are significantly different. That is unsurprising for the unmarked dies because those are boring, but the same does not apply to the other three groups. If anything, we would expect the dotted dies, which are the rarest, to have the highest N over D. The less common a coin is, the more likely someone is to collect it, to publish it, so the sample tends to be better for rarer, more collectible coins. The only explanation I can think of is that more coins were made, on average, by each numbered die than for each lettered or dotted. It is important to remember that dies were rarely used to their destruction, and that definitely was not the normal practice at the Roman Mint. What this implies is a different administrative procedure governing the quantity of coins produced for each series. And each series, of course, operated with a different rate of production. The lettered die groups are more complex, even than the numbered die groups for which we have a better sample. All of which suggests that these four groups of coins were made by different people, presumably in different places, using different technical procedures. But there was clearly a central production of dies, and presumably close proximity as some dies transferred from one section to another. Why such an elaborate and complex procedure without any obvious rhyme or reason to it? That is the wrong question to ask. I think that is the mistake a lot of commentary on Roman Republican coinage frequently makes. We might, slowly, elicit some sense of why the Mint did things, but it's not what the forensic tools die studies provide us with are good at. Die studies are great for telling us what people did, but nowhere near as good at telling us why people did it. In this case, they do tell us some very interesting stuff about what was done with Linkage 103. The people making the numbered coins received dies from a central production centre, but were distinct from the people making lettered coins, which justifies examining Linkage 103 as if it were actually two different die groups. And for some reason, it seems some dies a little more than 1 in 10, were never employed, either never delivered from the central engravers 
were never put into use. The numismatist Joe Cribb, in a series of lectures to the Royal Numismatic Society, described numismatic research as a circular process. You have questions. You look at the data to resolve those questions. That raises more questions, and so on. Eventually, of course, you run into questions your data and methods cannot answer. In this case, we don't know which dyes were not used and which dyes have simply not survived. The numbers suggest about 20 of each. What we have at the moment is essentially a minimum information solution. We know there are missing numbers. We know dyes were used, at least roughly, in order. And we know at least two workstations were involved. In part three, I will try to explore some of the ways we can make sense of the missing or absent data and think through the problem of how complex these productions might have been. Mm -hmm.